one of the founding members of the committee. We started when we went to Cuba for the first time in 2019 to participate in Cuba Ambiente, which was an environmental conference. Upon going on Cuba, I didn't know much, and we all had our minds blown and changed at seeing the difference that Cuba, the different economic system that Cubans live in than us, and it shows in many, many ways. But uh, with that said, we came back and we saw the need for an educational committee educating people about Cuba, specifically because the U.S. has had a criminal blockade against Cuba for over 60 years, and the saddest part is most Americans don't even know it exists. So we started this committee mostly to educate people, not to change anyone's mind, although I feel that happens by itself. To start us off, we'll have Pastor Eddie, who was very welcoming to us here. Not only the first time we're here, but I believe the third time we host an event here. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, I just want to welcome you to McCarty Memorial Church. Um, this church has been here since 1932, connecting spirituality and justice. And this issue is very important to us as people of the African diaspora. We care about what happens uh, in Cuba. Cause we know that religion at its best is not only about the liberation of your soul, but your body as well and your mind as well. That it is about justice, which is love in our relationships, but also a love in public, which is fighting for justice, and speaking out and having hard conversations and opening up our minds. And so you are welcome here. I hope this event is prosperous. This is the third time, I think, and you're welcome anytime uh, to come back. And this is what church is for, to, to nourish the soul and the mind so that we can move together for transformative change and so forth. So welcome here. Uh, we're so glad you're here and we hope this event is wonderful and that you leave a little bit more enlightened. Uh, if you ever want to see it, me on Sunday, I'm over next door at 1045. All right. I'm Reverend Eddie Anderson and I am the senior pastor of McCarty Moore Christian Church in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we decided to host this event uh, because we believe that our struggles intertwine with the diaspora in Cuba, right? As people of the African American diaspora, we understand that when the diminishing of rights and the medical apartheid and that there's an illegal blockade happening, that when grassroots folks rise up and say, let's learn about this together, let's figure out that there's a solution, let's advocate together, that that is the place where we want to be. Uh, if, if we are a spiritual place, if we are a place that truly believes in dignity and justice for all, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, then we have to host events like this. We have to expand our consciousness and we have to let people know that we will not sit by silently while people who look like us or come from various regions like us who have similar struggles are diminished. If their rights are diminished, so are ours. And so the spirit calls us to stand up in this moment. Yeah, so Cuba is one of the places that uh, during the, uh, the slave trade, um, that Pan Pacific slave trade, a lot of our ancestors were taken there. Um, and the rule of white supremacy and plantation capitalism really began to oppress and strip away the indigenous traditions and, and cultures of folks. And so um, that legacy of slavery lives on in a blockade. It lives on in medical apartheid. It lives on uh, in the ways in which America has treated Cuba for being a bold enough to be a nation of color, a nation that does not shy away uh, from their roots, but then lives fully into the liberation and wants to create a new way, a third way, a way where everyone has dignity and freedom. It may not be the plantation capitalistic way, but it's a way nonetheless that has brought uh, life and dignity. Think about the Cuban Revolution and the way that they educated everyone in the community. That is what we need in America. And so that scares America in many ways. And so that's a legacy of slavery. If you know anything about slavery in America, they didn't want people who look like me to learn how to read and write. They didn't want us to attain the dignity and the rights that we, that we are now still fighting for uh, in this country. They didn't want us to say that black lives matter. And that means all black lives across all African diaspora uh, matter. So Cuban lives matter, but yet, Cuba was the one who gave asylum to our ancestors when things got rough in America. And so our struggles are linked, and so we stand with Cuba. 
we have our second speaker, George Funmaker, who is the Native American leader in the water and land back rights movement. say good good evening good day to uh, all my relatives here and uh, my name is George Funmaker I'm enrolled tribal member of the Ho-Chunk Nation which is located in uh, Wisconsin on my father's side and my mother is uh, Spirit Lake Dakota from North Dakota so I just wanted to recognize my my lineage and my ancestors and uh, as a native person from from uh, the north I'm a guest here on, on Gabrielino Tongva land. So, yeah, let's give it up. And it's, our, it's our tradition and kind of our, our way of doing things is wherever, you, wherever you're at, to, to know and, and uh, learn about and acknowledge the original people of these territories. So we all benefit from living off, off this land here. So um, I want to uh, thank uh, Lo our brother Lawrence for inviting me. And to be honest, I, I didn't know too much about you know, Cuba. And so it's good that this is an educational piece. And I did a little research and, and learned about the uh, embargo and the blockade. And I thought about my own people's history. And I wanted to share a little bit about our history because it's very similar to what's happening in Cuba. So there was a, a Dakota War in, in the 1800s and they encroached on our land and we, we hunted and uh, we couldn't hunt anymore and they put us on reservations and uh, the, only, the only way we had sustenance was through uh, uh, the government would give us food supplies and that's, that's the only way we were able to survive because we couldn't hunt anymore, we couldn't live our traditional way of surviving. So during the Dakota Wars, the, the, the government officials who were responsible for uh, providing those supplies to the people, to our people on reservations, they, they started selling those rations to white settlers. So our people began to starve, our children began to starve, and our warriors and our chiefs uh, talked to the, 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 the U.S. officials and said, we don't want to go to war but our people are starving, our children are hungry, our, our people need to live. And they refused to uh, release the supplies to our people. And one of the government agent, agents said, let them eat grass, or let them eat, uh, uh, let them eat cow dung. That's a statement that he said to the Dakota people. So the warriors got together and decided that they were gonna go to war. And that was the, la the last option because their people needed to survive, their people needed food and supplies. So they went to war and um, they found that government official who said that to the people and uh, he was, uh, the warriors, they scalped him and mutilated him and they found grass in his mouth. And uh, so that was a little justice for our people because our, our people wanted to survive just like the Cuban people they want supplies, they want food, they, want to, they just want to live. But the U.S. imperialism and white, su white uh, supremacist government is blocking that, just like they, they blocked uh, our people. And our people went to war, and that spirit of revolution is, is in us, and, and to survive. And uh, the Tiano people of Puerto Rico and Cuba, the original people there, and Brother Lawrence was talk, uh, sharing about Hutue, I think his name was and the story of how he fought colonialism and how he fought white supremacy. So we have the same warriors like that in our, in our stories and our tribes and who fought, who fought uh, this government, U.S. government. And in our language, we call the settlers wasichus. And wasichus means fat takers. And the fat takers, uh, they, it's translated to the, they're the greedy ones. They wanted to keep the fat, the good meat to themselves. So that's what we call uh, uh, white people, our Europeans, colonizers. So I say these words and I see a lot of white folks here and that's good that you're supporting, but we call on you for your solidarity and you, and you to, to uh, put in some work for the people of color and our struggles, what's going on, uh, not only here but in Cuba and helping poor people, helping people of color 
uh, to survive. That's all we want. We want to live. We want our children to live. And um, so I wanted to share a song. And this song is to honor uh, political prisoner Leonard Peltier, who also fought against uh, uh, the U.S. government, American Indian Movement, 1973. And some of our leaders traveled to Cuba uh, in the 70s, uh, Le Lenny Foster, Leonard Crow Dog. So we stand in solidarity with uh, the Cuban Revolution and, and the people. And uh, so I wanted to share this song and ask uh, my sister uh, Stephanie to come up and help me sing. But this song is uh, the Leonard Paltier song. Hey, uh I reside in Long Beach and I'm a community organizer, grassroots organizer with uh, native issues in, in Los Angeles and environmental issues and uh, land back. Uh, so my brother Lawrence, who, who's uh, uh, one of the organizers of this event, invited me to come out and he, he wanted some uh, native representation, some native folks to come out and stand in solidarity with, with the uh, Cuban people. Definitely know all too well about U.S. oppression and U.S. imperialism, white supremacy. They've done that to our people, Native people in North America for hundreds of years uh, in 1492, starting in 1492. So going on 530 years of, of uh, oppression and, and U.S. Uh, imperialism. And uh, so the Cuban uh, embargo and blockade, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. blocking supplies and not being, not uh, letting the Cuba people be free in trade and commerce. Uh, so we know all too well about that, uh, about uh, how that how that is for our people too. So we stand in solidarity with not only the Cuban people but all people who are affected by U.S. imperialism. I think for me is is a lot of propaganda to be able to see through U.S. propaganda and what what is being shared in the media. So, uh, like Fidel Castro, you know, they, they portray him as, as uh, a bad person, but he was part of a revolution and, and uh, bringing, uh, he, wanted, he wanted what was best for his people at that time. So, uh, learning about these different struggles is very important, and uh, events like this kind of help people to understand what it exactly is going on and be able to see beyond the U.S. propaganda, what, what the media puts out and what the U.S. government puts out to kind of know the truth behind uh, uh, what's really going on. I know for myself I'm going to share more and educate folks and learn how I can stand in solidarity uh, with, with the Cuban folks and, and uh, uh, better educate my, my community about what's going on in Cuba. My name is Carlos Lasso. I'm a Cuban American and an activist for the lifting of the blockade, the sanctions that are hurting the Cuban people. I'm a U.S. veteran and a father. Being a teacher is one of the great gifts that I ever had in my life because uh, my students, uh, uh, somebody who wants to change the world, who, who wants to do something for humanity, the best place that you can achieve that is by educating, by helping uh, new generations, right? And in my case, I take this seriously. Uh, and my students are my family too. And I take my students to Cuba, by the way. I just two weeks ago, we, we came back from a trip where I took 40 students and some of their parents to Cuba, and we delivered 5,000 pounds of milk to pediatric hospitals. And those were breaches of love in action. Yes. Tito Carlos, Tito Carlos Lazo, Tito Carlos Lazo, Tito Carlos Lazo, 
Tito tá. Tito Carlos Lasso. Tito Carlos Lasso. Lupe Carlasco Cardona. Tito tá. Tito tá. Mundo. Tito tá. Brenda Lopes. Tito tá. Jay Chan. Tatum 57. Tatum 57. Tatum tá. 45. Tatum tá. 80. Tatum tá. Tatum tá. Titi. 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 Ok. I start this uh, uh, conversation with you. First of all, doing the first thing that I do in my class when I start the, the school year. I'm a teacher. I'm a Cuban American. I live in Seattle, Washington. I have been in the United States for the last 30 years. And the first thing that I do in my class, in the, I teach Spanish, is trying to show the students who never have taken Spanish how we tend to replicate and learn from each other even without knowing what is going on. Because I say, Tito Carlos, the, the kids didn't know and you didn't know what Tito was, but you assume this communication that human beings have, you assume that Tito Carlos means my name is Carlos, and then you start making connections, and when I say Tito Ta, you already create, create your own rules for the language, right? But the same thing we do in Puente de Amor. Puente de Amor, Bridges of Love, is an organization where we try to do actions. We are not defined for what we say we are. We are what we do. As Jose Martí used to say, the best way to do, to, to say, is to do. We don't say we are this, we are that. We, we say we do things and then let our actions define us. In our movement, we, I, I'm so happy to be here because in our movement, we invite people from all creeds and ideologies. This is something very normal in the Cuban community. The Cuban community before have been defined and in the United States mostly by people who define themselves, say themselves that they are right from the right. And they, of course, if you are from the right, you support the blockade. And if you are from the left, you are against the blockade. That's the whole paradigm, paradigm, right? In our, the new par paradigm that we bring is that to support, to ask for the lifting of the blockade, you don't have to be from the right or from the left. You have to be a decent person. If you are from the religion of Islam, if you are a Christian, if you are whatever, a Jewish, if, if you are communist, if you are anti-communist, and you are a decent per a person, you have to be for the lifting of the blockade because the blockade is not just a political thing, it's a moral thing. And this message has been resonating in the Cuban community lately. And during the last 20 uh, months, we have been doing caravans. Uh, we start, I start with my two sons and my two uh, grandsons, and my, my two uh, nephews biking from Seattle to Miami to Washington DC, 5,000 kilometers two years ago. After that, people start replicating that in their cities. In Miami, a bunch of crazy people start saying, oh yeah, this okay is hurting on families. And, and, but I'm from the right, and then I say, it doesn't matter if you are from the right, you are a family man. You have to be against this cruelty. And then people start joining our movement. And then people start joining our movement in New York, in Seattle, in LA. And the only condition to be part of this movement in the United States, around the world, is that you are a decent person, a person of family, and you want the lifting of the sanctions that are killing the Cuban people. Uh, and the sanctions really are killing the Cuban people. Besides doing caravans, we have taken some other actions like taking custodial to Cuba. What is custodial? I learned this word recently. 
So we only say solution that is used for uh, liver transplants, in general for transplants. It's a solution that you have to use to keep uh, the organ viable. Somebody is still alive, a, a father is don donating the part of the liver, and you need to put that liver in this solution, keep it there, in order to put it in the, in the, in the, in the person who is going to receive the donation. And when I went to Cuba, I learned two months ago that uh, there were eight Cuban kids who need transplant, but because the U.S. blockade, because the embargo, because the sanctions, we don't fight about in our movement about the name of this cruelty. We can use blockade, embargo, sanctions, whatever is killing the Cuban people. And then we find out that Cuba couldn't buy the solution in the United States because we need a special license. Imagine, you need a special license, the United States have to issue a special li license for the life of eight Cuban kids. The United States is God, because God is the only one for those who believe who can take life or give life, right? And then when I came to the United States, I tried to buy the solution. No company wants to sell me, a, sell me a solution. I went to uh, call uh, Germany where they sell the Custodio solution. They said, for Cuba, no, I'm sorry, we cannot sell the solution. Very expensive. Finally, we found the solution, the third country in Mexico. We bought the solution. Uh, the solution for the eight kids, first, the company in Mexico never knew that it was for Cuba, because if they know that it's for Cuba, they won't sell it. Why? Because there is, Cuba is in the, in the state, the list of states who support terrorism. And companies are afraid to sell things to Cuba. Uh, uh, financial institutions are afraid to make any transaction with Cuba. Then we say, well, we, we have a problem to find a place. We found it. Now, how we get and, 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 and fund this effort, $25,000, where I get it? Difficult, right? And then I went to my Facebook, where I have a bunch of right winner Cubans there, and left winners too, who love uh, being there in my page, when we sing, make poetry, dance, and whatever. And I start explaining to these people that this is about family. This is about uh, family values. This is about the cruelty that the sanctions are doing to the Cuban people. And suddenly, many people in the Cuban community, people from the left, from the right, it doesn't matter. I never asked that. I start putting money there, $10, $10. And in 10 days, we got the $25,000 from this community. say that uh, Miami is the city of hate, because a lot of hate comes from that, but from that place. But we also say that Miami is the city of love, because a lot of love is sleeping there, because uh, hate is very noisy. Love is child, but those who love are more than the one who hate. And then we have been, uh, and I come, I know this, that people can come back from hate because I come back from hate. I, I used to support the embargo in 1993. I was in prison in Cuba in 1988 when I tried to leave the country, and I went one year to prison. And I thought that Cuba was the worst country in the world. Finally, in 1991, I got another raft, and I arrived to the United States. And I came very bitter about the experiences that I had there. And I thought that Cuba was the worst place in the world. But when I went to Miami, with all my bitterness, I found even more hate over there. And I found that I don't want to become that type of city. And my father one day, remember this, my father in 1993, he went to, to Miami to visit me. And I was discussing with him, just like any kid discuss with their parents, political issues, we always are having uh, arguments most of the time against the position from, of our parents. My, parent, my father was a communist, and I said, yes, they, they deserve to be located. And then my father looked at me, my father who had been going to prison, taking care of me, putting family first, even when he was a communist. And he said, son, you are not like that. This is your family. This is your people. And when he looked at me, suddenly I feel shame for what I was becoming. 
and suddenly that scene, that conversation start moving me to love. I visited Cuba in 1994 and the situation was very bad, the special period. And then when I visit my family, my friends, the people who have helped me, because my mother left Cuba when I was 15 and I lived there in an apartment by myself when I was in high school. And the families that I have mostly were my neighbors. They gave me a plate of soup, they gave me good advice. And when I saw those people having uh, hungry with lack of medications, I said, no, no, I, I cannot take a stand against these people. Finally, the last thing that put, well, how we say, la tapa al pomo, I don't know how to translate that, but the thing that, the last drop in the... The lip, the lip. Si, ahí mismo, was in 19, in 2000, I become a, a combat medic, and in 2003 I went to Iraq. And I participated in the Iraq invasion. I was a soldier, a combat medic in the Battle of Arusha. And when I saw what it was going on over there, when I saw all the destruction that a war from a powerful country can do to another country, I, I swear that I will dedicate my whole life to the cause of bringing together my adoptive country and my, the country where I was born. And I will fight all my life for breaches of law. And that's the reason because we are here today. We are here today because we need to get some money, some funding for these special machines that the Cuban hospitals need. We need the help of everybody. There is a QR code there, and we need the people to help. We need the people to participate in the caravan, similar to the ones that you have here before. And, and next, this month, the very first of July, we are going to have having a war, international caravan. My, I'm going to be in Miami with my brothers and sisters over there. And we need that you do something here. Even if you go with a sign, we tell the people, if there is a, a caravan in your city, go to the caravan. If there is no caravan in your city, be the light in the darkness. Go there, participate. And we hope that this movement and this a thing of getting united with brothers and sisters from different organizations, from different political, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You are what you do. You, you are. And, and somebody told me once, uh, talking about revolution, that a, a, a truly, a, a, somebody said that, that a person who is truly revolutionary is guided by higher uh, feelings of love. And that's what we do. We try to, we, we try to do that. We try to bring love and if we are making a difference at least in the Cuban community. People are joining to our community. We are attacked every day in Miami by the media because they know that love cannot be defeated. And even if love is defeated, it still is a winner against hate. And that's the reason because we are here. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. During the last two years of Obama, we did progress. Uh, the United States moved closer to lifting the sanctions, to lifting the embargo. But Trump came to the presidents. And then everything that Obama did, Obama allowed Americans, more Americans to visit Cuba. Cruise lines were going to Cuba. Cubans came here frequently. They have visas to come over here. Uh, Cubans start uh, receiving Americans over there in their business and all that. But as soon as uh, Trump came, he started taking down whatever Obama has implemented. And not just that, but also implement 240 more measures, 200, more than 240 that basically punish the Cuban people. For instance, in the middle of the pandemic, Trump prohibit Cuban Americans, Cubans around the world, or anybody around the world to send money through the CEP, to, through Western Union. Basically, you cannot send money to Cuba, to your families, remittances. This is prohibited. And you imagine that in the middle of a pandemic. Who is the United States government to tell you, I'm sorry, but you cannot send your hundred dollars to your mother who is in Cuba. And they have been, uh, Trump put Cuba in the list of countries who sponsor terrorism. And it's really very sad because Biden didn't do anything, and the financial institutions 
around the world, they don't want to deal with Cuba. They refuse to do any business with Cuba. Uh, the, the rationale, the message of the United States is that they are hurting the Cuban government. No, they are hurting, they are killing, they are affecting the Cuban people. And they are hurting very bad the Cuban people. Well, yes, there is a lot of irrationality in the policies of the United States toward Cuba and toward many countries, but especially toward Cuba, because the United States uh, says that they want to change Cuba to a more democrat democratic model, more like the United States. But first of all, how many countries are monarchies? How many countries don't have the type of democracy that the United States has? And the United States has a perfect relationship with them. Right now, our president is in Saudi Arabia, right? And I mean, people know what is going on here. And then uh, by keeping Cuba for 60 years, in a, a, a implementing policies that hurt the Cuban people, hurt the American people, and are against the best interests of both countries, is totally irrational. The best way to, to change this is if we can show Americans what is going on, if we can show the American people, because most of Americans don't know what is going on over there. Most of Americans, Cuba, they get just the media, and uh, whatever the media says about Cuba, and that's one of the reasons because the United States prevent Americans from going to Cuba because they don't want to see the reality. And Cuba is, is a country with many problems and with a lot of uh, dark, but a lot of light too. A lot of bad things, like many countries with, with a lot of things that the United States can learn from. And I see that when I take my students and talk to the Cuban people and how they build bridges of love by learning each other about their communities and about their life, right? And then I think that Going back to the question, if the Americans are educated about the inhumanity that is happening 90 miles from our coast, that's a time when this is going to start changing. Uh, my name is Guadalupe Cardona. We are in West Los Angeles at the Hands Off Cuba event um, just to raise awareness about the blockade against Cuba and the impact that it's having on the Cuban people, um, specifically as it pertains to um, their health and different medicines and uh, medical supplies that are needed. So to raise awareness in the hopes that um, money and um, medicines can be raised to take to Cuba. Here in the United States, people of color have often provided labor um, for capitalists to be able to you know, have big business, big agriculture, big um, industry in general. And um, the people in Cuba have essentially said, you know, in 1959 that they weren't going to provide that for the United States anymore, that they were going to um, keep the industry for the country in order to um, allow for all people to benefit from the labor of the people as opposed to what we see in the United States, which is where um, the labor, um, the people who form the labor force do not really benefit from the wealth that they generate. And so what we have in common is that um, right now the blockade against Cuba has put the people of Cuba in a position where they are, um, they're also um, struggling, they're poor, very similar to the people of um, the United States, the people of color in the United States. I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, and I've been uh, a part of the grassroots movement for um, ethnic studies in schools. And so essentially my message was that we are um, fighting to carve out a space, although we would prefer a larger space in the school system, but at least a one um, semester course or a one year course of ethnic studies where we can look at issues that have impacted people of color in the United States, specifically here in California because um, the legislation that we've been working on has been here in California just to ensure that students for the first time get to see themselves and their history in a class and um, that struggle has not <laughs> been very easy it's been a 52 year plus struggle and uh, what we're seeing right now is that even though we were able to in the legislation win a one semester course graduation requirement that there are all sorts of other groups that are 
trying to also get themselves into that um, that very short you know curriculum, and so it's been a struggle. But um, but within that, we're bringing up issues having to do with um, you know systems of oppression, which um, also illuminate the the blockade against Cuba. It is very frustrating because you start to see some progress and you're starting to see where um, families that are here are able to help their families and um, and that that hope that um, really what Cuba has will be able to blossom into fruition, which we know that for a period of time they were able to. So yeah, it's very frustrating because you see the sort of light and then it gets kind of like, um, you know, very sad and frustrating and scary, really, because we don't want the Cuban people to have another um, period of time where you know we see essentially like a famine even happening in Cuba. So it's very scary. I think that um, I really appreciate that people from all different walks of life are here together, and so in whatever way that you f you know feel called to join the movement to um, end the blockade against Cuba, I you know I really welcome folks to do that, whether it's through education or art or music or raising funds, um, awareness, um, and but what we really need are folks that are uh, knowledgeable in policy that can help get policy change, organize for policy change. But I think, yeah, I think that's really the message is we can't just like forget about, you know, the Cuban people. We need to remember that's part of our humanity. And, and if anything, also um, what they have done in Cuba with so little is so beautiful. Like we have so much money even just here in Los Angeles alone. Yet we have, you know, people that are living on the streets. We have people who are suffering so much. You go to Cuba and you really don't see that. You, you, every single person has a home to go to. Um, they have, you know, access to education. Of course, not, there's, you know, things that we can critique everywhere, right, including in Cuba. I'm sure there are things that, that they could work on. But to the extreme and the extent that we have in this wealthy, resourced country, not at all. So I would definitely say, let's not forget about them, let's study them, and let's uh, even you know emulate what we see in Cuba. My message was really about um, there are many reasons why we would want to go to Cuba and to learn from them regarding how they think through their health system, um, how they prioritize community health, their focus on prevention, um, you know, the, um, the discoveries, the innovations they've had in like pharmaceutical development. Um, so, you know, my main message was to be able to convey, you know, the importance of that and how, how we have a lot to learn. Um, but also to talk about when, you know, the reasons why we go um, are the reasons why we can't afford not to go, um, which is that, you know, with what's coming up in our futures when it comes to pandemics and disaster management, given the path that the world is on when it comes to issues of climate um, as well as war, given that path, we have no choice other than to, like, build stronger relationships with Cubans and to think about the livelihood of the Cuban people as directly connected to ours um, because they have gotten a lot of experience globally in studying these situations. And um, right now, you know, more than ever, we need to have these um, cross-country collaborations that are meaningful. These grassroots conversations are important because people often think that politics is not something that, like, is directly connected to their everyday lives. And so being able to be in places that are easily accessible, that are friendly for people to come and to learn about the issues, is where you can make the connections, so like why is something like this relevant to me? Um, and how is it connected to the things that are the most important in my life? Um, so I think these kind of grassroots spaces are, you know, um, fantastic opportunities to do that. But I also think yeah, in the grassroots spaces, we, um, we think of each event as like needing an outcome when we really need to, you know, when this is the benefit and something that can, you know, primarily only be achieved through grassroots, I think it's important for us to see the grassroots as an opportunity to build over time. Um, and so, you know, I really enjoy the invitation to be here to talk about, um, like, what we're learning and, like, why we go. Um, but it's, the, I think, the continuous conversations in this way without necessarily having to be, you know, part of some sort of outcome um, that are really going to build the momentum for us and, and get the change. And I think that's only possible at the grassroots. Sadly, what the United States desires is Julian and the Cuban nation's 
heads on a pike. Please excuse that horrible analogy, but that is what they want. They want to send a message to the rest of the world what happens to those who stand against the neoliberal, pro-corporate, privatization, and capitalist idea of what is acceptable to the United States government. Let me close with these words. Larga vida el pueblo que urbano y la justicia para Julian Assange hasta la victoria siempre. Thank you very much. My name is Vincent Stefano. I'm here with the Assange Defense Coalition. I'm here to speak on the hands of Cuba. And the reason I'm here is because what is happening to the Cuban people, what has been happening to them for the last 60 years, has many similarities to what is happening to Julian Assange. I'm here in, uh, in solidarity with the struggle of the Cuban people because the Cuban people face the same kind of lies and misrepresentations that Julian Assange is. The only difference is the Cuban people have suffered for over six decades. Julian suffered something close to 12 years of that same thing. But the might of the American government is used in exactly the same fashion against Julian as it has, as I said, for 60 years against the Cuban people. Both have been accused of crimes they did not commit. Both have been tarred and feathered with lies, misrepresentations, and both have the things that they've provided to people, the Cuban to their own people in health, education, and well-being, and Julian, the message of truth to the world about the crimes the U.S. government commits in our names, those are absent from the story that we hear about both Cuba and Julian. And I'm here to show that there is a connection, a direct line connection to what the United States has been doing to Cuba for 60 years and what it's been doing to Julian Assange for the last 12. Uh, my name is Jose Prado. Uh, I'm a professor of sociology at California State University, Dominguez Hills. And uh, I've been in communication with Mark Friedman principally, and more recently with some of the other members of the uh, LA US Hands Off Cuba Committee. Cuba sana, y el mundo sanará cuando Cuba sanará. And that means that uh, Cuba heals, uh, Cuba heals the world, uh, and uh, the, the world will heal more completely when uh, the blockade is lifted against Cuba. And so that, of course, means uh, that the restrictions uh, on medicine on account of the blockade, restrictions on medical equipment and such, um, you know, uh, that are imposed on, on Cuban society uh, uh, need to be lifted. I'm a Chicano professor. Uh, of sociology and I came through the uh, academic channels as it were uh, by way of the inspiration of the Cuban Revolution on the Chicano movement of the 1960s and the 1970s by way of the inspiration of the Cuban Revolution on the black movement of the 1960s and the 1970s um, and so uh, that, of, that, of course, in addition to the sort of things that I've just mentioned right now about my grandfather, for instance, um, these things have, you know, uh, come together. And uh, I share this information with my students. And if, and if I am any inspiration for my students, it's on account of, um, it's on account of this history. And so I, I share it with them, and I'm hoping that this history will inspire them. The students that uh, are able to reflect on their family experiences, the students that have the patience to think about their families, the students that have the patience to think about their communities, the students that have the patience to read <laughs> and to have conversations with one another, thoughtful conversations, meaningful conversations, uh, those are the students that are compelled and um, Later on, I, I learn uh, that my students are doing, some of my students are doing some really fascinating and wonderful things. I wish it was the case 100% of the time, but you know, it, it simply isn't so. But it, it is sometimes the case, you know, that they do the sort of work that I think is important. My name is Lynn. I'm part of LA Moss, LA Movement Advancing Socialism. And, well, we are part of a multinational anti imperialist socialist collective that, um, yeah, is in solidarity with uh, the Cuban people. 
and it only makes sense to come here. Well, we are, you know, in support of the revolution that has led Cuba to this point where, you know, the U.S. is punishing them for ousting out American corporations that exploit the Cuban people, and they are continuing to be punished for, you know, setting a standard for the Global South and for us here in the Imperial Corps to, you know, I guess end American imperialism. Like, I think there's a lot to combat. Um, because the truth is, where the, the benefits we have, even though of course there are poor people here, you just see a homeless encampment, just walk down the block. The truth is that we do experience a certain level of comfort and material conditions because we do benefit from the global south. And that's hard for people to get past. And that's understandable. Like I, I struggle that too. I, on a personal level, I question my discipline on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, but it's not about guilting people like, oh, you know, you have you know, certain privileges by living here, but it's to really like, you know, challenge ourselves and really like, you know, are we really down with the people? Um, because people are, you know, fighting right now for it. I mean, a comrade who was part of Bayan talked about, yeah, a health worker who was killed by the state because she is providing health care to um, the indigenous women out there. So, yeah. So how do we go about, you know, um, addressing all the barriers is, I do feel like talking to the individuals here today and listening to the program was inspiring, um, just to remind us like why we're out here. And that, I think Las, uh, Carlos Lasso talk, talked very well about um, not being so dogmatic. Like in the end, like it doesn't matter if you're right or left, like if you're down for, you know, people not being, you know, oppressed, that should be it. If you're a family man, that's how we like put it, or family person. So just maybe even just focusing on like just human aspects, not talking about politics in a very like academic way. Like, do you care about people? Straight up. So, I am Vietnamese American and um, yeah, I, I understand the struggle of my parents who left Vietnam during their socialist transformation and coming to America and wanting to hold on to like the, you know, I guess the American dream while they're here. Um, yeah, that's a lot to combat and they, they growing up they're like, the socialism is bad, and but like you said, like not focusing on necessarily socialism or all these ideology. Um, on like a, just a human level, like I realized, like I shouldn't be talking to my mom or my dad that like, oh, I know more than them. Like I'm more progressive than them. But meeting my parents where they're at, you know, my parents are working class people. My mom, I don't is like, well, I don't have to go into detail with my mother, but you know, my dad barely makes minimum wage, right? And has worked at this company for decades and they fuck him over. Oh, I don't know if I can't curse. My bad. Um, but those are conditions that like, even if my parents and I don't see eye to eye, I organize every day because I want my parents to benefit from, you know, like I guess a socialist society. But I can't be coming to my parents like, I'm a socialist, I'm a communist, they're not gonna listen. It's more of like, you know, dad, like, you know, how was work today? And like, you know, meeting him where he's at, like, you know, why he doesn't agree with the minimum wage going up because he's been working so hard. Why should people who he thinks doesn't work hard enough? I don't agree with it, but you gotta meet, I mean, I have to meet them where they're at. Um, and same with my mother, that like, I'm not better than them just because I, I've read some theory or I, I hold on to a certain political ideology. Um, but yeah, I learned from my parents and they will be learning from me too. My hope for Cuba, yeah, is definitely this lift the blockade and for them to continue their any project they have without interference from from us um, so yeah self-determination basically my name is Lawrence Reyes I'm with the Puerto Rican Alliance of Los Angeles former young Lord party member and I ended up here because I'm a member of the uh, hands of Cuba committee of Los Angeles so Boricua estoy aquí de parte de la Alianza Puertorriqueña de Los Angeles soy este este miembro del de comité este mano con este eh, quitando la mano uh, de Cuba de los Estados Unidos. And what was the message you delivered here this afternoon? My, the message that I deliver is that Cuba does very a lot with very little. They engage in medical diplomacy, educational literacy campaigns. Uh, they serve humanity. And that was my message. I wanted to highlight the humanity that has been the result of the Cuban people becoming literate, 
uh, becoming medical diplomats in the world, wherever there's uh, an outbreak, wherever there's a hurricane or an earthquake. Uh, they offer help to Puerto Rico when Puerto Rico experienced Hurricane Maria, and the United States blocked them from coming into, into the island of Puerto Rico. American foreign policy is cruel, rational, bipolar, unipolar. Uh, it is uh, discriminatory, it is genocidal, it is imperialistic, it is uh, uh, colonialistic, uh, it's, it is cannibalistic, uh, and it's full of lies. So um, the lies, the economic, economic lies that, that have been told, the economic exploitation and the economic, economic deprivation uh, that the U.S. foreign policy uh, ships Exports around the world is part of that cruelty. Well, the mission is to assist the, the med medical diplomats, assist the Cuban people in being able to sustain themselves and survive by um, finding anesthesia machines that they could perform to do surgery. We engage in the campaign for syringes so people from uh, for people in Cuba could be vaccinated against the COVID virus. And uh, Cuba has a 95% vaccination rate. And so we feel we have been successful. And we, we understand that some people may be opposed to the politics of Cuba, but they should not be exposed, they should not be opposed to the inhumane economic blockade of the Cuban people. It's misogynistic politics of Saudi Arabia, uh, where they, uh, they uh, oppress women and they oppress and even murder journalists. Um, you know, and, and President Biden goes and fist, pump, fist, fist bumps with, with, the, with the king of Saudi Arabia uh, because, again, it's about an economic lie. The economic lie this time is that he needs uh, Saudi Arabia to increase its oil reserve uh, and increase oil shipments in order for them to drive down prices. Because the aesthetics is the politics. The politics is that if he's able to lower uh, gas prices, then his party will have a chance to hanging on, hanging on to Congress against the Republicans. So again, it's, it's, it's really cynical, uh, the U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy uh, the, and the lack of diplomacy that it has, it has not engaged with in, in, in Latin America um, and just the demonization of Latin American leaders really is, is, is an example of that foreign policy. You know, the United States, this, this is a, a, what George Orwell would talk, a doublespeak. Um, you know, you, you speak on one hand and then on the other hand you spite your face, right? So, you know, this whole notion of calling Cuba, Nicaragua, you know, Venezuela, and other Latin American countries and putting them on a, on a terrorist list is, is like, the United States' hands are not clean. I mean, they, they, their hands have been dirty for centuries. So for them to even have the nerve or the, or the audacity uh, to put somebody on a terrorist list without any justification or without any evidence, because why? Because they're helping people around the world and because they're educating their people, they're providing free medicine, they're providing free housing, while um, the United States engaged in the healthcare system that is, is a profit-driven healthcare system where people are not, I'm a diabetic, and I could use some of that diabetic medication that Kuwa has developed. I've had a toe amputated, so I know what it is to suffer from diabetes. And yet, they have the nerve to say that Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and I'm sure they're going to put Colombia on there because of the recent election, um, that they are terrorist states. That's preposterous. It's shameful. So Tsukuro Force, uh, I am a founding member of Pacific Asian Nuclear Free Peace Alliance. Um, I happened to be at the People's Summit back in um, June, and I um, came across your booth. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the story, really. Um, so what's the, what's the message you brought to this audience here today? What did you want to communicate about Cuba, about the struggle, yes. solidarity? What, what did you say to the group? Yeah, so um, I have been advocating for ending sanctions against North Korea with my Korean siblings for years. And as a Japanese person, um, I feel like that's my responsibility because um, my ancestors, frankly, did very, very horrible thing to Koreans. And uh, I, I feel like, you know, I, it's my duty to correct the wrongs of the past 
by acting in the present. Um, and another thing was, uh, so you know, I believe any sanctions, blockade, uh, embargoes are wrong. You know, it's inhumane, so it, it must be stopped. And I was actually, um, my message was, so Che Guevara, he visited Hiroshima in 1959. He made a point of visiting there. And uh, he showed such compassion and solidarity with the ordinary people of Hiroshima. So I felt like um, I have this soul connection and I really have to be here. I was actually specifically speaking in my speech about um, Korean families who live here, for instance. You know, they really, um, they ended up here, not exactly like, you know, um, out of their desire to be here. They were, you know, a lot of them were fleeing their country. And they ended up in this country. And now, because of travel ban, they cannot even go and see their families. And this is just because the U.S. insistence upon, you know, this false propaganda, essentially, that these countries are terrorists and all that, you know. And that is just really absolutely wrong. I mean, in many aspects, but it's inhumane, as I said, it's morally corrupt. And this is like the worst um, demonstration of imperialism. So, yeah, that's what I have to say. I'm new to this, actually. I, I, I'll be perfectly honest. You know, uh, I'm still learning about Cuba. But what really struck me, actually, what um, caught my attention, actually, was, you know, during COVID, them going all over the world and just offer support, you know, without Offering, uh, without asking anything in return, right? So, I mean, that to me, I mean, that really hit me, you know, in my heart. And that, I just thought that was just so amazing that there's a country, you know, very small country, but acting on their faith and, you know, principle, you know, standing far, so firmly in their principle that they can sustain themselves, I mean, despite of all you know, pressure, like economic pressure from the United States, you know, uh, the richest country, you know, in the world. So, yeah, that's just very, very impressive to me. And I'm healthcare justice activist as well. So, yeah, I mean, universal healthcare, yeah, um, we need that in this country as well. Channing uh, Martinez, uh, director of organizing at the Bus Rising Union Strategy Center. We actually went to the People's Summit this year, which was fantastic, and uh, Mark came up to our table and said, hey, I want you guys to table. And we were like, okay. <laughs> um, but obviously, also, I saw the flyer, and we've been saying U.S. hands off of Cuba for years, because they should have their hands off of Cuba and Venezuela and so many other countries, and so we wanted to come and show solidarity. Well, when we think about the buses, we think about the buses as a factory on wheels. And what I mean by that is that everyone in that bus is a worker. They are making money for the system and they're making it easy for the system to survive, right? Um, they're subjects of exploitation, subjects of neocolonialism, and we're trying to figure out how do we organize that grouping of folks to really rise up against their own oppressors, which just happens to be the metro, as an extension it happens to be the United States. But that struggle mirrors almost exactly what's going on in just about every third world country right now. That there's neocolonialism and colonialism going on, not just by their own government, but by the United States through their international policy and imperialist policies. Right? And so we're trying to figure out how can we, and this is the message I was saying to people, how can we grow a base of folks that don't just see the U.S. or, quote, Americans as their community, but sees the world as their community, and then sees what it really is and wants to fight with that community? Well, one thing I'm learning, because I'm still a student of history, um, one thing I'm learning from the 1960s, um, movements in the 1960s, is everyone thinks it was all about civil rights. but. You know, when I look at some of those movements, they were connected to South Africa, they were connected to Zimbabwe, they were connected to 
Cuba, they were connected to Venezuela, they were connected to so many different liberation countries. I mean, I just learned that Mao sent Mao, like President Mao, the head of the state, sent a note to students in Colombia who were going against Columbia University um, for having a department that's studying weapons of war, right? And they shut down the campus and they did a lot of great protests. Mao sent them an actual note and said basically, good job, keep doing what you're doing, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, our movements are trying to be strong, but we are not nowhere near as strong as um, what's necessarily or historically necessary to take on this gov U.S. government, right? And you need international solidarity, and you need to be fighting on all fronts in order to take it on, um, because otherwise they're going to use your struggle here in the United States and see see what we gave you, which means. Don't go meddling internationally and talking about what's happening in Palestine and what's happening in all these countries. We're giving you stuff, right? We know that, you know, buying us off is not a real viable solution. Uh, we start with the concept of race. Race is the basis of the oppression and the repression here in the United States and all over the world, right? And so that's why we use the concept of imperialism, right? It's the imperialist oppressor country against the oppressed country, right? And uh, we are trying to use race as the frontline framework. Um, and whether you are black or Latinx or indigenous or white, if you're not recognizing race as the first thing that the United States is leading its struggles with, right? I think you're not really seeing the full picture.